So good morning, everyone. And uh, let's continue uh, where we left off yesterday. Uh, uh, so what we are <coughs> looking at now is the uh, chronicles of the Buddha, which is the very famous Pali verse about Iti Piso, Bhagava, Arahang, etc. Uh, and just to remind you, this is how the Buddha himself recommends that we actually reflect on his qualities. Uh, and uh, uh, so, and uh, yesterday we only got as far as the Tathagata appearing in the world uh, and kind of stopped there. Uh, and then the next one uh, we're here is uh, accomplished, the accomplished, fully enlightened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime, knower of the worlds, incomparable, leaders of persons to be tamed, teachers of gods and humans, enlightened or awakened and blessed. So this is the, uh, the qualities of the Buddha. And uh, one of the things that you can, when you look at that formula straight away, that is kind of very obvious about this formula, it is all about the, the Buddha's insight, about his understanding. Yeah, this is kind of one of the things that is a very important part of this. Uh, and the other aspect is his teaching part. Yeah, the idea that he is the uh, incomparable teacher, in a sense, of humanity. And these are the two things that come out here. His insight, uh, and you can say maybe his compassion and his ability to teach. This is basically what the Buddha is. Uh, yeah, insight and compassion, understanding and teaching. Yeah. And um, of course, what the, one of the first things that straight away is striking about this, uh, there's nothing here about supernormal powers, uh, nothing here about kind of marvelous and miraculous events or anything like that. Uh, whether those things are true or not, uh, you know, I personally, I think that there's amazing things you can do with the mind, which are really remarkable, but that is not what is essential as far as the Buddha is concerned. The essential aspect is the wisdom aspect. Uh, and this is so important to uh, remember, because in the large parts of Buddhism, the focus on supernormal things is just such a massive focus on that, and the focus on the Buddha being able to do all kind of uh, weird and wonderful stuff, uh, not just the Buddha, but if you look at contemporary Buddhism, how, uh, you know, modern, how modern Buddhists often <coughs> talk about the Dhamma, it is so much about, oh, this monk did this, this nun did that, this person did such a thing, yeah. and as if this is the be-all and the end-all of the Buddhist path, when really it is just a sideshow. It's got nothing to do with the essence of Buddhism at all, whatsoever. Yeah. So it's important to remember that. One of the things that I remember always stood out in the suttas uh, is from the Kevada Sutta. This is in the uh, Diga Nikaya number 11. Uh, and in there, uh, the lay people uh, in a certain town, I think it's Nalanda actually. Nalanda is where, of course, the famous Nalanda University was established about a thousand years after the Buddha. And if you go there today, you can still see the very impressive ruins of that university. Uh, uh, but in this little town of Nalanda, just the village in those days, uh, the lay people, the Buddha is visiting, uh, the lay people go to the Buddha and they say to the Buddha, please do some, do some kind of fly me through the air, or kind of sink into the earth, and this kind of stuff. Uh, yeah, do some kind of marvels, we want to see some wonders, uh, because if we do that, more people will get faith in Buddhism. Yeah, you know that argument? It's a kind of argument you hear all the time. Yeah, people get faith by seeing all these marvelous things. Uh, do people really get faith from that? Uh, if you see some magician on TV, TV walk on the Thames, yeah, or kind of walk out on the, do you get faith in that magician, or do you think that he's doing some magical trick? Yeah? He's doing some magical trick. Yeah? Exactly the same thing happens in Buddhism, and this is what the Buddha says specifically in the Sutta. Those people who have faith, uh, they, they will say, oh, what a marvelous thing that, you know, look at what these monks can do with their purified minds. It's astonishing. Yeah? Those who haven't got faith, they will dismiss it as just a magic trick, it's just David, David Copperfield or something kind of doing his stuff. Uh, and this is what you can <laughs> expect with these magicians, yeah, who are kind of sons of the Sakyans, <coughs> sons of the Buddha. Yeah. So it doesn't really work. Yeah. And then the Buddha says, because of this, uh, because these things will be dismissed by people who haven't got confidence in these teachings, and we know what that is like, that's what people do all the time. Uh, because of that, I detest, I abhor, he used a very strong word, uh, these psychic powers. Uh, yeah. This is what the Buddha says about these things. Uh, and then he forbids his monks, there's actually a rule in the Vinaya against showing off psychic powers in this way. Uh. So even, even if they exist, and I think they do exist, uh, 
uh, they're not something. It's, it's completely tangential to the path. It's got not, not, nothing really to do with what the purpose of Buddhism is about, uh, which is finding real happiness, contentment, end of suffering, all of that. Uh. So remember, please remember that, because this is, uh, I think, a very important thing, because we get so easily get sidetracked with these things, yeah? If, uh, you know, if, if uh, someone here, if I started to kind of fly up in the air, it would look pretty impressive, but it would just be like entertainment, yeah? It would be marvelous entertainment, but that's all really all it is. Uh, when you come sink into the ground and disappear into the ground, uh, it would be kind of astonishing to see that right there in front of your eyes. Uh, but uh, uh, again, it is at the end of the day, it's just entertainment. And of course, that's often what people want. They want to be entertained. Uh, but that is not what this is about. So this is the, the first thing. So what comes out of this uh, uh, sequence of qualities is actually the Buddha as a masterful teacher and one with uh, insight into uh, phenomena. And of course the phenomena that he has insight into is uh, psychological things. Yeah, the human condition, that is what it really is all about. Uh, so let us look at some of these qualities. The first one here, accomplished. Uh, and this is the Pali word arahant, yeah, which many of you will know about already. This is a standard word in the suttas to uh, show the perfected person who has taken, gone all the way to the end of the path. And the, the word arahant actually existed in India even prior to Buddhism. So it's one of this terminology that was taken by the Buddha and then used in his own way uh, according to you know, with the Buddhist ideas of the reality. You know. And the word arahant, really, what, what it actually means, it really means someone who is worthy. It's a worthy one. That's what it actually means. And uh, what, uh, what is an arahant worthy of? What is anyone worthy of who is an arya, a noble one? Uh, well, what they are worthy of is our respect, uh, yeah? our, even our generosity, uh, our support. Uh, why is that? Well, it's just like any teacher. You know, if you have a teacher who uh, teaches you well, who uh, imparts some kind of knowledge to you, like you haven't gone before, you go to university, you want to be a doctor, yeah? Then you have to go to medical school to become a doctor. Yeah? And of course, you have a degree of gratitude to those professors and teachers who teach you medicine. Yeah? Without them, like, you wouldn't go very far. Yeah? And it's the same thing. So in, in the old days, you know, when the, before we had a public schooling system, yeah? And people, you would pay those teachers, you would be hospitable to them, you would kind of support them in your own way, yeah? and you would show your gratitude to them, right? you would respect them. And even today, people, of course, you would respect our teachers to some extent. Yeah? So what is it about the Arahant? Well, the Arahant is almost, in a, in a way, like the supreme teacher. Yeah? Why? Because they have the ability to give you an understanding of reality that leads to the highest thing that anyone can desire in this world. Yeah? real happiness, real contentment, uh, the thing that everyone ultimately is striving for, everything that life is about, is really about finding that uh, you know, final sense of satisfaction, all the things that craving are demanding of you. Uh, if you look inside of yourself, what is it that we are all searching for? What we're searching for? The sense of completion, of fulfillment, of satisfaction. Uh, that is what craving is all about, but never actually gives you. Uh, but it can be found. Uh, and of course, the areas, the noble ones, they have the key to that. They have the key to, for you to access these things. And that is why they are worthy of uh, their arahants. They are worthy ones. They are worthy of our support, our respect, our generosity even. Yeah? The uh, standard phrase in the suttas for the uh, noble ones, the areas, is that they are ahuneyo, uh, dakkineyo, uh, Anjali Kalaniya, which means the worthy of respect, worthy of uh, offerings, hospitality, and this kind of thing. That's what it actually means. <coughs> so this is, uh, this is the meaning behind this particular word, uh, the Arahant. But uh, generally it just means the person who is spiritually perfected. That's really what it means in the suttas. Uh, fully awakened, yeah, Samma, Sambuddho, uh, is the, uh, the next word here, and this idea of awakening. Uh, uh, is obviously very important on the Buddhist path. Uh, yeah, again, about the very end of the path. Uh, what does it mean? Uh, and uh, what it means, the main meaning of it is just that you have awakened to reality. And awakening to reality, seeing things as they actually are, yeah? Yatabuddha Nyanadasana, seeing things in accordance with reality. 
well, uh, if, if you're going to be able to understand what brings happiness and, and suffering in the world, the only way you're going to do that is by seeing things according to reality. Yeah. If you are deluded about things, uh, if you don't know what you have to do, if you don't understand things in the right way, there's no way you're going to be able to make the right choices uh, to see where happiness is and where suffering lies. Uh. So seeing things according to reality is kind of part and parcel of uh, you know, finding meaning in life, finding purpose. And if you think back to the idea of dependent origination, uh, we just gave a talk about that in London the other day actually, uh, and uh, one of the things that uh, you see in dependent origination, it starts off with avidya, delusion at the very bottom. That is the root cause for this whole sequence of 12 factors in dependent origination. Then it goes up, and where does it end? It ends up with dukkha. So if you have avidya, if you are deluded, you have dukkha. Why is that? And actually, it's, it's fairly obvious. It's, it's quite intuitive why that has to be the case. Because if you are deluded, it means you don't know where you are going. It means you don't know what is the right thing to do. And if you know, if you, uh, you know, if you uh, don't know where the dining room is afterwards, uh, when you're going to have to go for lunch, uh, you're going to suffer when you're hungry. You want to go for lunch. You are deluded about the direction to the dining room. It's going to cause you suffering. Yet, it's a very simple way of looking at it, but that's basically what it means. Uh, whenever we don't know the right way to something, we are deluded about it. Uh, we're not going to find happiness as a consequence. So this is why avidya, uh, delusion, must result in suffering in a certain way. And by contrast, if you are not deluded, if you see things in accordance with the reality, it leads to the opposite, it leads to happiness. Because now you can make choices based on a correct vision of reality. Yeah, it's actually very obvious when you think about it, isn't it? It's very straightforward. So this is the main, one of the main meanings of what it means to be a Samma, Sambuddha, the fact that you uh, have that direct insight into reality. Uh, and the consequences of that are that all the defilements of the mind uh, have disappeared. Uh, yeah, so no more defilements in the mind, uh, no more being pulled around by craving and by ill will, this kind of stuff. Uh, but you are always at peace, you're always at ease, uh, always uh, pure uh, inside. Uh, yeah, and, uh, uh, suffering has come to a complete end. That may not, again, that may not sound so uh, wonderful, but of course the opposite is also true. You have achieved the highest happiness in life. Uh, so anyone who is into the highest happiness, they are, you know, it's the Buddhist path is going to give you give you that in the, in the final, uh, you know, if you develop the path all the way to the end. So this is the idea of awakening in Buddhism. You know, the light turning on, seeing the reality as it actually is. Uh, and there are some very beautiful similes for this uh, uh, that we may probably hopefully have a look at later on. Uh, uh, one of the questions that sometimes comes up in Buddhism is what is the distinction between an arahant, yeah, ordinary arahant, uh, who is a follower of the Buddha, uh, and a Buddha? Is there a difference between them? Uh? And I remember some years ago I was in India, I was leading a large group of people in India. Actually, look, this was my first trip, I think, I was leading a pilgrimage to India, and there was four buses of 120 people. They really kind of, okay, now you're going to lead a trip, and they kind of, I was just kind of starting out teaching, and I was a bit overwhelmed by this large group of people I had to bring around. But uh, anyway, this is kind of how you baptize my fire, they call that, uh, and you really kind of uh, get, get it going. <coughs> so I remember one of the people there who was a kind of more of a traditional Buddhist, uh, uh, he, he said to me, well, you know, what is the difference between the Buddha and the Arahant? And I said to him, well, actually, you know, there isn't that much difference. Uh, the insight into reality is the same. Yeah, the only difference really is that the Buddha goes first. The Buddha actually finds it first. Uh, and he was really upset about that. Uh, what do you mean that the Buddha isn't special? Well, how can you say such a thing? Uh, this is terrible. Uh, and, but actually, it is straight from the suttas. Uh, yeah, it's not kind of me, I'm not just making up random stuff to kind of to you know, to, for whatever reason, it's actually straight from the suttas. The Buddha says so himself. The distinction is that I discovered the path, now other people follow along afterwards. That is the difference between the Buddha and the Arahant. And you may think this may not sound very impressive, just like this fellow who came to India with me, it may not sound very kind of, it may sound like we're putting down the Buddha or something, but not really. 
Remember, the point here is that the Buddha is a human being just like the rest of us. So if we elevate the Buddha in the wrong way and we misunderstand what the Buddha is about, it actually detracts from our ability to practice these teachings. So we say some, one of the things that you notice very quickly as you start reading the suttas uh, is that a lot of it is like autobiographical accounts by the Buddha. The Buddha talks about himself. He says, I did this. Yeah. No. He says, I had defilements. Uh, this is one of the amazing things you read the suttas. The Buddha talks about how he practiced. He talks about his own wrong view, about his defilements, about the problems he had in meditation. Yeah. You go to there's a beautiful sutta about this called the Upakilesa Sutta. Upakilesa means like defilements, if you like it. And the Buddha talks about all the defilements in his mind as he was trying to attain the jhanas, attain samadhi. And when you read that, you realize that, uh, you know, you are in very good company. Each one of us, we're in really good company. The Buddha had similar problems to what we have in our meditation. Isn't that kind of reassuring in a way? Yeah. It makes you feel more hopeful that there is a way out of this, that there is a way forward. You're not stuck with that mind of yours. It can be developed, it can be changed. But the point is that the reason why the Buddha teaches all these autobiographical suttas, and there is maybe about 10 of them in the Majjhima and almost all of them are very practical, they are advice on how to develop your mind, how to live your life. The reason why the Buddha teaches these things is not to just to kind of talk about himself. Yeah, he doesn't really have an interest in that. Uh, the reason why he teaches these things is to give us advice uh, on how to practice. Uh, and you can imagine if the Buddha is completely different from the rest of us, uh, if the Buddha is, you know, the cosmic principle, the Dhammakaya, and these kind of things, uh, well, what does his practice have got to do with ours? It's got nothing to do with our practice because he's different. He's something else. He's like a god. He's like a uh, you know, all encompassing consciousness or whatever. Isn't it? Of course, there is no connection anymore between what he did and what we should do. And all of these wonderful biographical suttas are found everywhere, isn't it? they become meaningless and pointless. So, this is why it is so important that we understand the Buddha in the right way. He is like us, he's one of us. He has transcended, he has taken the human condition to the pinnacle of what's possible. That is what makes the Buddha special. Isn't it? but essentially is a human being, just like the rest of us. So when we put the Buddha on a pedestal, yeah, this pedestal right here, then, holding up the Buddha, when we put the Buddha on a pedestal, it's important to put him on the right kind of pedestal. Then. What is the right, the wrong pedestal is the God pedestal, yeah, who worship a God, that's the wrong pedestal. Then. The right pedestal is the perfected human being pedestal, that is the right one. Then. So you get the right idea of you know, what a Buddha is. Then. You know, in many ways, I, you know, you think about the idea of a god, you know, the idea of a creator god. And I, have all, I sometimes thought, about, well, what do I, what, what do I respect more? Do I respect more a creator god or a Buddha? What is kind of, a, what is more impressive, a creator god or the Buddha? Well, and I thought, well, if you are the creator god who created the universe, well, you have always been like that. Yeah, you've always been perfected. You've always had all of these things. Uh, you didn't really do anything to get there. You kind of, you've always been the creator god, and then we kind of pray to this creator god to help us or whatever. This kind of thing. So, I was never a Christian, by the way. So this is why I'm sometimes a bit cheeky about these things. Uh, I grew up in a non-religious family, yeah, so I never had that kind of background at all. Uh, but the Buddha, by contrast, the Buddha started out yeah, with a, a, as an ordinary human being, through his own wisdom, through his own practice, he was able to perfect himself. So if I were to choose who should I bow down to, who should I respect the most, this creator God or the Buddha? Well, to me, the Buddha is far more impressive. Yeah, far more impressive what he did. He actually developed himself, he cultivated himself, he broke through to the truth. He wasn't born into this state. Yeah, so for me, the whole idea of what the Buddha performed and did is actually really, really worthy of respect. So, um, what is it uh, then? You know, is the Buddha is it the same as everyone else? And of course, it is. He isn't. In one way, he is not very precisely because he was the first one that makes the Buddha special. Yeah, we are all trying to follow the Buddha's footsteps. We are given the. Uh, the formula for how to get there on a plate, just do this and you will get there. 
And still, it is quite difficult. Yeah, even though you're given the exact instructions on the plane, sit, just be kind, sit down, don't do anything, watch the breath, and bang, it will happen. And still, it is so hard to do that. So, you know, I, you know, they always kind of ask around how many arahants in the room. I stopped doing that because there's so few people who raise their hands. Yeah? But, uh, <laughs> So, so not so many elephants around. Yeah, we don't kind of, we kind of, we don't see them in the street every day or anything like that. Uh, so that is what is so impressive by the, of the Buddha. By, you know, that, uh, with the Buddha, the fact that he was able to make that breakthrough even without a teacher. Yeah? Most people, it is so hard to have a teacher. He did it without that. That is what is so absolutely astonishing. Yeah? And it shows you a certain maturity of uh, you know, spiritual faculties that he had, uh, which is very rare to come by here. Yeah. Anyway, Samma, some Buddha, yeah, the, 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 the Buddha, his uh, awakening, what that, what that means roughly here. Yeah. Then we have the next one here, perfect in true knowledge and conduct. And knowledge here is Vijja, yeah, conduct is Charana. Uh, Vijja Charana Sampando uh, in the Pali language. And uh, uh, Vijja, uh, knowledge here, is the opposite of Avijja. Avijja is delusion. I prefer to translate Vijja as insight. Uh, yeah? This word, by the way, is related to the word, English word wit. Yeah, the English word wit. Yeah, if you are witty, it means you're funny. Mm -hmm. but, but wit also means that you are sharp, you're sharp witted. Yeah, it means that you're intelligent as well. And it's very similar to the, uh, it's actually exactly the same word as uh, vidja or vid in Pali. Yeah? It means someone who has insight, someone who is a kind of has understanding. Yeah, it's in the same way. In the same way, in almost all, I think, European languages, in Norwegian, we have exactly the same word. Uh, Witte, witte, which means witte, same as in English. In, in, in German, you have some Germans here, is that right? Some, some Germans here, because one lady was German. You have one, okay, great. So in German, you have wissen, yeah? Wissen is also the same root, exactly the same word. Wissen is uh, knowledge or understanding in, in German. Yeah? So, uh, Wissenschaft is science, right, in, in German, yeah. yeah. So you have, uh, it's, these are common in the European roots, and they still have the same meaning today as they had uh, back then, except that witty means uh, is, is something slightly different, of course. But witty also has to be, has to do with being sharp, yeah? So it has a similar kind of thing. Anyway, this is a slight sidetrack, yeah. So, um, uh, vidja, uh, insight, what are the vijjas, what are these insights? And this is kind of interesting, there's many different takes on what insight is in Buddhism. But the insights that are called the te vidya uh, on the Buddhist path, the three insights, uh, are the insights of uh, uh, remembering your past lives, uh, yeah? understanding the laws of karma, and finally uh, making the breakthrough to becoming an arahant. Uh, these are in Buddhism like insights. Uh, yeah, it is a it is a very fascinating. These are the things that re really revolutionize your outlook on the world, uh, make you see things differently. Uh. I was just mentioning before that real insight is like the light coming on. Uh. Prior to that, like you've been walking around in darkness. Uh, yeah, you don't really know what's going on, and suddenly somebody turns on the light. Uh. You don't have to bump your head into things anymore because you know where you're going. Uh. This is the problem with not seeing things clearly. You kind of keep on hurting, suffering all the time, like bumping your head or you know, uh, uh, you know, walking into things and you know, getting your turning your toes or whatever it is. Uh, uh, th these are the profound insights on the Buddhist path, uh, and all the way to arahantship. Uh, it is a different way of thinking about insight from what we normally think about it. Uh, but actually, this is one of the very valid ways of thinking about that. Uh, so this is a. Uh, the meaning of vidya usually in Buddhism. It can be expanded out to refer to like the three characteristics and all of that sort of stuff as well, of course, uh, which of course is also extremely profound and it's related to awakening. Yeah. But uh, that is just one way of looking at it. Yeah. And then there's the other side, and that is charana, which is conduct. One of the things, when you have insight into reality, yeah, when you see things as they actually are, it affects your psychology. It affects who you are as a person. If all your defilements have gone, and all that is left inside of you is compassion, kindness, metta, wisdom, yeah, if that is all that is left in your mind, it's obviously going to affect your conduct. 
Yeah, obviously. Yeah. So a person who is enlightened is not going to do crazy stuff. Yeah, there is this idea of crazy wisdom. Well, I say, I do crazy or you're wise. There's not a thing as crazy wisdom. Yeah, you are crazy or you're wise. You're not both at the same time. And there's nothing in the sutras that, you know, say anything about crazy wisdom. If you are pure, that is expressed in your actions, how you live. Someone who is enlightened does not get angry, they're not greedy, they don't have 93 Rolls Royces, yeah? <laughs> like that uh, scallywag Osho. <laughs> so, and, and, so this, so, and this is actually very good news, uh, because it means that it is possible for us to ascertain, at least to some extent, who is enlightened and who is not. Uh, you have to have your wits with you, and you have to have your vija, yeah, your wits, back to that word again. You have to observe carefully, yeah? but trust your own judgment. Uh, don't be afraid of using your judgment to, you don't have to judge absolutely and say this person is bad, this person is good, but have to have a rough idea, yeah, who you can trust in this world, uh, who is worthy of respect, who is worthy of, uh, you know, taking as your teacher, if you like, yeah. These things are, this is important, if you don't trust our own judgment, what are you going to trust? Uh, in the end, you have to rely on your own judgment in these things, uh, so observe carefully, uh, yeah? Be alert, observe over long periods of time. Uh, don't make rash judgments. Uh, uh, always be humble enough to reverse your opinion if you find that later on that you've made a mistake. Yeah? There's nothing is worse than to be so sure of yourself that you actually go wrong because of that. Uh, uh, and then uh, you will be on the right track. Look for the qualities that are expected in someone who is awakened. Uh, yeah? The kindness, the compassion the wisdom, the serenity, uh, all of these things are supposed to be there. If they are there, then there is a chance. You cannot be absolutely sure, but then there is a chance this person may be uh, at least on the right track. Yeah. If someone is not like that, uh, then there is a good chance they are not the real deal. Yeah? You don't have to make absolute judgments, but just enough to kind of guide you in the right direction. Right? So uh, I, I've heard people say things like, yeah, you know, I don't trust my own judgment, so I take this I, I get, let other people make judgment for me. Uh, yeah, I have this teacher who is really cool. He makes the judgment for me. But who chose that teacher? I have to ask them. Uh, oh, I did that. Oh, yeah, right. Okay, so you did the choice in the end after all, right? Uh, and this is the point. It always comes back to us at the end of the day. In the end, we have to make the judgment. Uh, it comes back to your ability to uh, to see things right. So trust yourself. Uh, yeah, you have no choice but to trust yourself uh, anyway. But uh, realize your own limitations. Realize that sometimes you get it wrong. Yeah? And if you do that, then you're going to be on the right track. Yeah? So this is the Vidya Chadana uh, aspect of, of this one. Yeah? And uh, then we have the word sublime. Sublime is the word Sugata. And this is one of the famous epithets of the Buddha. Yeah? Sugata means something like it. well gone or just well. Yeah? Yeah? So someone who is like happy. Uh, Sugati refers to a good destination. So this, in a sense, means the person who has gone to a good destination, in a sense. Uh, the Buddha has gone to the right in this very life, gone to the highest destination, the highest kind of happiness. Uh, Sugata. Knower of the worlds. Uh, yeah, or knower of the world. The loka vidu. Vidu again, vid, the same word as in vidja. Uh, and uh, this traditionally can be said to refer to, of course, someone who understands all the various kinds of rebirth and who understands kamma and these kinds of things. Yeah? Traditionally in Buddhism we have this idea of the various levels of rebirth. We can be reborn in bad states, in good states, in the human realm, animal, all of these kinds of things. That's the traditional way of which means understanding the world. Yeah? You have a full oversight or what you know the various kinds of rebirth uh, but um, yeah, that is there's nothing wrong with that really it's, it's uh, you know it's a fair description of what is going on but uh, really what what all of this refers to really is that it refers to the scope of happiness and suffering that is available in the world uh, that is what it really refers to uh, yeah so when you if you uh, look at the human realm, you can see a wide variety of conditions that people are in. Yeah? There's a lot of kind of misery in the human world, and then there is a, a some people who are happy, some are really happy, like the Arahants, uh, 
So there's kind of a wide variety in the human world. Uh, so, but of course the Buddha, he has to ask himself, is this all there is to it in the universe? Uh, and then he looks at this and he realizes actually uh, the, uh, the, the scope for happiness and suffering is far more than this. Uh, because you can be reborn in states that are far more happy and states that are far worse. Uh, so because of that, he, what the Buddha does, basically his knowledge of the world is to grasp the full scope of happiness and suffering that is available. And only when you understand the full scope of what is possible, the full range of these things, uh, only then can you make a decision about what is right, about where you should be reborn, if you should be reborn, how you should be reborn, uh, once you understand what is going on. Uh, and not only that, but you also have to understand the mechanism, yeah? If you understand karma, what you understand through karma is that these things are impermanent. Uh, why? Because the karma has a certain uh, pot potential to keep you reborn in a certain place when that potential is, uh, uh, is gone, uh, yeah? then you, you disappear from there again. These things don't last forever. Because they don't last forever, they are unsatisfactory. You get reborn in a bad state again later on. Uh. <coughs> so this is the idea of this. The idea of Loka Madhu is to understand the whole scope of happiness and suffering in the universe and how it also comes about. Uh, and then only can you make the decision about what is the appropriate uh, consequence of understanding that. Uh, how are we to understand other rebirths anyway? Sometimes people have a big problem with the idea that it's possible to be reborn in a different state. Uh, yeah, what about these devas? Do these devas really exist? Uh, what about ghosts? Is it possible to be reborn as a ghost? Uh, if I do, does it mean I can come back and scare my relatives afterwards? Uh, <laughs> Sometimes it happens, yeah, you can make you scared of relatives, but it's not really on purpose, it just happens because uh, you are kind of reborn in that realm. Uh, and uh, the way to think about this uh, is uh, to remember that when you get reborn as a deva, it is not suddenly that you something has radically changed. It's still you, yeah, oh, now I'm here, I'm a deva, I'm a cheapest. Okay, this is what it's like to be a deva, their bodies like this, they're kind of translucent and beautiful or whatever, isn't it? So this is what it's like to be a deva. Or, or, you, or you have made some bad karma in your life. Bang, there you are. Oh, I'm a ghost now. Gee, this is terrible. Man. Yeah, I feel really hungry all the time. What am, this is bad news. I hope my relatives make some good karma. They do something that makes some merit from me so I can get reborn in a higher state. Oh, this, is, this really sucks being reborn as a ghost. So this is the thing. When you get reborn in these states, it is not something alien. It is just you continuing. There you are, you find yourself in a new situation with a new body, with new friends, yeah? If the friends are more kind of, uh, uh, you know, and you can kind of enjoy yourself in a different way or whatever, uh, that's really all it is. Uh, it's just a continuation of you. Uh, these things are not alien. Uh, it is just you continuing in a different state. Uh, and if you think about it like that, actually, uh, it is not very wonderful and marvelous at all. Uh, it is just a uh, uh, sort of continuation of your personality, if you like. Yeah. So that is the uh, you know, idea of these things. It often has to, if we look at these things in the right way, uh, they actually become fairly commonplace. They don't become so strange or so, so weird as they may seem at first sight. Uh, so uh, this is uh, how I uh, regard this idea of uh, knowing the world, uh, yeah, being the knower of the world. Uh, uh, is a full understanding of happiness and suffering that is available for human beings. Uh, then you have the idea of uh, incom incomparable leaders of persons to be tamed. Yeah, incomparable anuttara. What is it again? Anuttara purisadana sarati. Exactly. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, so, um, um, so to be tamed. Yeah. I think tameable is maybe a better translation than to be tamed. To be tamed to me is a bit ambiguous what exactly what that means. Who is to be tamed? But tameable makes better sense to me. So uh, the unsurpassed leader of tameable people. Huh? So what does it mean to be tameable? Huh? Are you tameable? Huh? Does everyone hear tameable? Huh? <laughs> uh, and uh, the answer is, of course, tameable means, firstly, that you have to have an interest in the Dhamma. You have to have an interest in the Buddhist teachings. Huh? If you have no interest, well, then of course you're not really tameable. Yeah, nothing is going to happen. 
you know, you, you hear the Dharma and you think, yeah, yeah, whatever, and you kind of do something else. And, yeah, but a lot, a lot of people are like that. They, they hear the Dharma and this kind of doesn't resonate with them at all. And it has kind of no effect on them. And there's an amazing example from the sutras about that. And, and there's a, in the sutras, just after the Buddha's awakening, he, you know, he thinks, oh, what should I do next? Should I teach the Dharma not? Who should I teach it to? And then he decides, okay, I'm going to teach to my five disciples, yeah, the five ascetics who look after him. And, and then he starts walking because he knows that they have gone to Benares, Varanasi. I don't know if you've been to Varanasi. Yeah, it's actually very, it's very nice. I've been to Varanasi, yeah. Well, it's very nice to go to Varanasi in India and see some of these places. It's very, yeah, it's quite interesting. But, uh, and you can almost walk in the footsteps of the Buddha in a certain way here. Yeah. But anyway, he walk, he's on his way to Varanasi. And as he is on his way, he meets this person, this wanderer. Is he a wanderer or just, I can't remember whether it's, I think he's just an ordinary person. His name is Upaka. And uh, he meets this Upaka, and this Upaka looks at the Buddha. You can imagine, just freshly awakened Buddha, yeah? You're the first person who gets to meet the Buddha after his awakening here. There are some, in some claims that other people met him before, like Tapusa and Balika, who were the merchants, but uh, that's a bit uncertain. I, I take this person to be the first one who met the Buddha after his awakening here. Yeah. You can imagine, just awakened, yeah? You're just seeing the reality of the universe. You're going to be so blissed out. You're going to be so kind of, your faculties are going to be so sharp. So this Upaka looks at the Buddha and says, wow. Your faculties are really pure, you know? What, what happened to you? What's, <laughs> what's going on here? And uh, then the Buddha gives him this response, yeah? This verse that, uh, 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 you know, something, I can't remember now, I wish I had it here. I, but something about, uh, uh, I have discovered the highest truth or something like that, yeah? Something kind of awe-inspiring. Yeah? And then uh, Upaka says, which was a common thing to say in those days, well, who is your teacher? Yeah? And then he says, I have no teacher. I'm self-enlightened through my own wisdom. And then Upaka's response to that is kind of, oh yeah, may it be so, and he walks off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and this is the problem. You are, in, you are here, you are, face to face, with the greatest spiritual genius in human history. Someone who's able to break through to the truth all by himself, and he is at this sharpest moment just after his awakening. Yeah. And you just don't get it. And then it says in the Sutta that he walks off on the Kumbhanga. Kumbhanga. Manga is path, yeah? The Arya Tangi Kamago, the Noble Eightfold Path. The Kumbhanga, Ku is one which means wrong, basically. Yeah? He takes a byway, walks off on the wrong path, and disappears. Yeah? And you never hear about Upaka ever again afterwards. Yeah? And this is the problem with, uh, uh, with the Arahant. Sometimes we can't really recognize them, even when they are face to face with someone like that. Yeah, yeah? it's kind of fascinating. Yeah? So this is what it means to be tameable. Sometimes you just uh, you're just not ready for these teachings, uh, and uh, you hear them, you just shrug your shoulders, and you walk off, and you you know you do something else, uh, and uh, that is a, a problem. So this is the idea of being tameable. At the very least, you have to have an interest in these teachings, uh, and uh, remember that uh, Buddhas they arise only irregularly in the in the world, uh, and uh, what. We are doing when a Buddha arises, this is so uncertain. Our wisdom comes and goes, our practice comes and goes. If you fall under the wrong influence by somebody, you kind of go away from this path. Yeah. So this is, if you are capable right now, well done. Yeah, you're here already. Well done. Good on you for saying Australia. Good on you for being capable. Yeah, so you are, we are all here. Well, I'm hopefully capable as well. So we're all here. We have this opportunity here. We don't know when this opportunity is going to come again. So grasp the moment, grasp the opportunity. Now it is here. This is a great way of inspiring yourself to practice these things, to, you know, moment to moment, to be someone who practices kindness, practices goodness in this life. We need some encouragement to do these things because it's actually quite difficult to always be kind, always have thoughts of compassion and metta to our fellow beings, it is quite difficult to do because our minds tend to believe us astray, etc. We need a little bit of encouragement. Now is the opportunity. You are in the presence of, you know, the Buddha, the greatest spiritual genius in human history. And uh, what an amazing thing that is. Uh, yeah, you, in a sense we are so lucky. We're not so really luck because nothing is really luck, but in a sense we are so, still we are fortunate in a sense. Uh, 
and then so to grasp the opportunity is what this is about. Now we are tenable. Now we have the chance. Uh, we have been reborn at the time when the Dharma is available. What a wonderful thing that is. Uh, and then you are kind of taking this the right way. Uh, so the, we are tenable, and then you meet the incomparable leader of these tenable people. Uh, and Sarati, it means charioteer, is the one who kind of uh, leads the chariot in the right direction. Uh, and uh, uh, so what is it about the Buddha that makes him incomparable? Uh, and there's two things that I just mentioned before that in my, in my mind makes the Buddha very special. Uh, and of course one as aspect of that is his wisdom, uh, where he has the full understanding of the human condition. Uh, he knows what it means to be human. Uh, he knows that we're all searching for something. Uh, what is this craving inside of us? What, what is it all about? And of course, what it is really about is for it wants, we all want to find that uh, point where we are satisfied. Yeah? Craving always tells us if you pursue this, if you look after this, if you do these things in your life, you will be satisfied. Uh, when you're young, you look at the future and think, yeah, I want to do this, I do that, yeah, I get married and have this kind of job, yeah, then I will kind of be satisfied. But it doesn't happen. You never get satisfied this way. Yeah. It always just goes on. There's something more afterwards that carries on and on and on forever. Yeah. Uh, and uh, here is someone who understands that search in the human heart. He understands that fully. And not only does he understand that, but he has found a solution to the human predicament. Uh, yeah, this is what wisdom really means. He knows happiness and suffering fully. Yeah. He has found the uh, goal, the purpose that everyone really is searching for. Uh, nothing can be higher than that. Uh, yeah? if, you found, if you have discovered the meaning of life, uh, the answer to the meaning of life, and it's not 42, isn't that what it says in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? That's 42? Is it not 42? He was wrong about that. Uh, it is not 42, it is something else. Uh, and the Buddha has discovered that. Uh, so uh, this, this is why it is so powerful, yeah? You're touching on the very meaning of life here. It is not, this is not some kind of trivial thing. It is the very essence of what life is about. Uh, once you get that, it becomes like, uh, what else can I do with my life? Uh, everything else becomes madness. If you found the meaning, are you going to say, yeah, whatever, but now I'm going to go and have ice cream? You know, that's not what you're going to do. Uh, if you found the meaning of life, you commit yourself. If you get that, you commit. Yeah? You persevere. You practice accordingly. Yeah? So getting this idea that this actually is the meaning of life is extraordinarily profound. It drives you forward. It makes you commit to this amazing path. So try to see if you can see it in that way. For me, this was a massive eye-opener. After I've been a, you know, I've been a Buddhist monk for a long time, Ajahn Brahm never really put it quite that way. But when it kind of became clear to me that this really is the meaning of life itself, uh, how could I not commit? Uh, how could I disrobe? Yeah? I mean, still sometimes the kind of the idea you know, of disrobing, you know, still sometimes uh, when I look back over my 20 years, of course, sometimes it happens. Uh, that's because there is a clash between the ideals and kind of the cravings that arise. Uh, but uh, in general, once you, f f once you feel that you have discovered the meaning of life, uh, in general, it tends to carry you through the difficult periods. Uh, and uh, because you know that you're on the right path, you know that you're doing the right thing. Yeah? So it's actually extraordinarily powerful. So here is someone who has discovered this. Uh, yeah, this is why he is the unsurpassed teacher. The wisdom faculty has been developed to the absolute highest. Uh, that is one side of the Buddha. The other side of the Buddha is that he is coming from compassion. He knows that he has the answer to the meaning of life. He knows that everyone in this universe is searching for the answer, whether they know it or not. We're just doing it through our actions. So by following our cravings, we're actually showing by our very actions that we are searching for these things. Yeah? He knows he has the answer. He sees the suffering among people, among animals, among all beings. What happens? Compassion arises. Yeah? And because of that compassion, he starts teaching. It's important to keep in mind that for the Buddha, it would have been far easier to just sort of chill, yeah? go back to a cave, yeah, relax, get into the jhanas, and do nothing. Far better. Yeah? Why, why, he has nothing to gain by teaching. The Buddha doesn't want to be popular. He doesn't care about having disciples. Disciples are a hassle. Yeah, they are a problem. 
You know, ask Ajahn Brahm. He said, oh, to my disciples, such a headache. That's what he says all the time. And they all want to travel here, travel there. And his, Ajahn Brahm says quite rightly, the job of a good teacher is to get rid of disciples. <laughs> Not, not that you know you want them to kind of stray and kind of you know be, you know become atheists or, or, or Muslims or Christians or that's not, not in that way, but to get rid of them in the sense that you teach them until they have enough understanding that they become self-sufficient. Yeah, this is the purpose of being a teacher. And for the Buddha who has given up all sense of self and all of these things, to have disciples it really is just a burden. It has nothing. There's nothing there apart from compassion that drives the Buddha to help other people. So what that means, is, in a sense, is that the Buddha has no vested interest in teaching. Yeah, he doesn't get anything out of it himself. In fact, all the Buddha has, he has a negative vested interest. It's actually a burden for him. So when the Buddha teaches, you can be absolutely sure that what he teaches is pure. Yeah, it is only for our benefit. It is only out of compassion, nothing else. It is not because of what he can gain from it at all. It is only because of compassion for others. So it's completely pure. He's not trying to please the crowds. Yeah? He's not trying to please anyone. He's trying to tell them what is going to be in your own best interest. And this is so wonderful when you read the Sutta, is to keep that in mind. Yeah? When you, the Buddha, if there's something you don't kind of make sense to you, it sounds too profound or too weird or whatever, no, don't throw it away straight away. Yeah? Give it time to reflect on it, to see if it makes sense. Yeah? Okay, initially you put it to one side, come back to it later on again, see if it now makes sense after you have developed a little bit. Uh, please don't throw them away, because remember, the Buddha is giving these teachings for only one single purpose, uh, to help, help you, to make you more happy, to make you find the meaning of life itself. Uh, that is why the Buddha is teaching these things, purely out of compassion. Uh, yeah, when you think like this, it becomes very beautiful, it becomes very wholesome, very kind of, uh, uh, you know, something very positive in a sense. Uh, yeah, and uh, uh, you start reading the sutta as in a new way. You start to read every word carefully because you know it is given for your personal benefit. Uh, and this is the other thing which, uh, so these are the two things the Buddha, compassion and wisdom coming together makes it extraordinarily powerful. Uh, this is the other thing which uh, uh, I always thought was so wonderful about the Buddha. He teaches out of compassion, but not only out of compassion for those people who are there in his audience. Uh, when the Buddha teaches, uh, you know, he sets in motion the wheel of the Dhamma. He knows it's going to be rolling on for centuries from one culture to another one for a long time into the future. Uh, and because he knows that, he expresses the Dhamma in ways that are very universal, that are applicable to everyone. Uh, so when the Buddha was giving these teachings, he knew yeah, that there would be people a long time into the future listening to these teachings. So he knew maybe that there would be people coming here to the Nightingale Center perhaps, yeah, and uh, listening to these teachings. So, uh, maybe, not, maybe not directly, but you know, indirectly he would have known about that. Uh, and because he, he knew about that, he would have, in a sense, had us in mind when he gave these teachings. So. Yeah, not, not us individually, but people like us. So in a very real sense, when the Buddha is giving these teaching, uh, teachings, uh, he actually has us in mind. Yeah. You are, basically you are directly a disciple of the Buddha, because he's thinking about us when he gives this teaching. He's thinking about people in far-off countries in the future. Yeah. So when you read that, you are literally... Literally, yeah, I'm not using literally in an unliteral sense, I'm using literal in a literal sense. <laughs> These are people say literally all the time, it means nothing, but literally you are a disciple of the Buddha. Yeah, so this is kind of cool once you get your head around that. It's actually kind of uh, gives you goosebumps uh, when you think about that. When you read these teachings, he's thinking about you. He gave them in this way so that you can understand them. Uh, yeah, and doing it purely out of compassion for no other reason. Uh, so these are the sort of ways of thinking about the Buddha that, that you kind of makes you feel, wow, actually this is pretty, pretty amazing. Yeah? And uh, it really, uh, you know, it gives you that sense of confidence and faith and feeling of joy on the path because you know you are in the presence of something absolutely remarkable and amazing. Yeah? So this is the Buddha 
uh, as the <coughs> unsurpassed uh, uh, teacher or leader of tameable people. Uh, and one of way, uh, as I mentioned before, to think about the Buddha, because uh, remember, it is important how we put him on the right kind of pedestal, not the wrong pedestal. Uh, yeah, so the uh, perfected human being, the person who has taken the human potential to the highest level, that kind of pedestal. Uh, so if you think about the Buddha, you can kind of imagine, imagine meeting the Buddha in ancient India. Yeah, imagine uh, going into the forest, or going into the jungle, uh, and what do you see? Well, is, this is actually quite common in the Sutta. Somebody goes into the jungle and then they see the Buddha sitting at the root of a tree. And then they approach the Buddha, yeah? And then they have a conversation with him. Imagine you doing that. Uh, you walk into the forest, there's a little wood up here. Have you been to the wood up here? Yeah, you go up there and then you see the Buddha sitting at the root of a tree. Wow! The Buddha is sitting there. Gee, this is what I'm going to do now. This is kind of... What, what do you feel like? What would you feel like if you saw the Buddha at the root of a tree up there? You feel a bit scared, probably, yeah? You feel a bit apprehensive. Gee, but how do I approach someone like this? Uh, and, but then, uh, as you do that, uh, yeah, you realize there's absolutely nothing to be afraid of. Uh. Here is someone who is perfectly peaceful, uh, very kind, very compassionate. Uh, the closer you get, you start to get into this atmosphere for someone who has all those marvelous qualities. Uh. Yeah, and then you sit down in the, the Buddha's presence because it actually feels very nice, it feels very peaceful. But the Buddha looks basically like an ordinary person, yeah? He wears robes, yeah? He has, has a shaven head. He doesn't look exactly like this because the robes that were at that time were slightly different and they were a bit shorter, probably. Yeah? But, you know, he looks like a monk, basically. Yeah? He looks like an ordinary person. And you're a bit unsure. Is this the Buddha? It doesn't look that impressive. Anyway, it feels nice and peaceful, so you sit down. Yeah? And then you start listening. Yeah, you ask maybe a simple question. You know, how should I live my life, you know? Please give me some advice. I feel a bit confused or whatever. And then the Buddha gives you a teaching. Yeah? And what kind of teaching does the Buddha give you? Some fancy intellectual teaching? Not at all. The Buddha gives you some very basic advice. He says to you, be kind. Be compassionate to the beings around you. Be generous. Yeah? That will lead to long-lasting happiness and benefit in this life and also future lives. This is the kind of standard teaching the Buddha would give very often in the suttas. Simple, but also at the same time very profound, because it does actually uh, lead to happiness. So, and then you thank the Buddha, maybe you bow down if you have enough confidence. Yeah? Uh, by the way, uh, we bow down to the Buddha's statue here, it's completely voluntary. Uh, it is not something you should feel any pressure at all to do. Uh, if you feel like it, please do so. If you don't, it's perfectly okay. Uh, so the same thing when you meet the Buddha. Yeah, sometimes you bow down, sometimes you don't. You don't have to bow down in the presence of the Buddha. The Buddha is very easy going. Yeah, it doesn't matter, there's no compulsion there at all. So then you leave. And you feel a strange sense of having been into the presence of something special. And then you build up your discipleship of the Buddha gradually starting from that. Yeah, and gradually you kind of gain insight into these teachings. So meeting the Buddha is not that special. Yeah, it is like meeting an ordinary human being. Yeah. The speciality takes time to develop. Uh, it takes time to understand the profundity of what is going on there. That is basically, probably, yeah, I'm just making this thing up, of course, but you know, roughly what it looks like in the suttas when somebody meets the Buddha. It's all quite easy, all quite simple. You feel apprehensive, you realize there was no reason to be apprehensive at all, because the last person in the world who's going to hurt you is the Buddha. Uh, the Buddha is there simply to help you out uh, and to encourage you and to move you in the right direction. Right? So that is the unsurpassed leader of tameable people. Uh, um, I will just finish off these qualities uh, because we started a little bit late because of some technical problems. There's always a few technical problems on these retreats. That's just part of the course. Uh, but um, the next quality here, teacher of gods and humans. Uh, yeah, so uh, uh, the idea behind this is that uh, uh, the Buddha teaches human beings uh, and uh, part of the idea behind this is to you have to understand a little bit of the background, the Indian background at that time. Uh, people would, just like in, in Hinduism in the present day, people in those days also had a large variety of gods. Uh, and they would, you know, Pajapati and all these kind of various gods, Varuna and Venhu, Venhu seems to be a prototype of Vishnu and already existed at the time of the Buddha. 
uh, as Shiva, there's a Shiva in the Suttas, all these gods already existed way back then. Uh, and uh, so, of course, when uh, the Buddha says that he is teacher of gods and humans, uh, what he is saying, you know, kind of hint, hint, you know, those gods that you kind of believe in, you know, uh, actually, you know, I teach those gods. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you get the idea. It's like a, it's, it, there's a term for this. I think it's called inclusivism, whereby you include other religions kind of into your own by pointing out, well, actually, you know, I have a wisdom that these gods of yours don't have that wisdom, but I have seen this reality here. And this is also, if you know the story of the Buddha's awakening, after his awakening, Brahma comes down to him. Brahma bows down to the Buddha and asks him to teach the world. Imagine the impression that would have given to the ancient, human, ancient Indian population. Brahma was the highest god. Yeah, Brahma was like the, you know, the all-encompassing consciousness and kindness of the universe, the creator and all that kind of stuff. But in Buddhism, Brahma comes down and bows down to the Buddha and asks the Buddha to teach. Yeah, so this is kind of, it's almost like Buddhist propaganda, yeah? <laughs> almost a bit like that. And some of these things are probably have a slight propaganda character to them. They were probably not actually spoken by the Buddha, this idea of Brahma coming down. I'm not sure if it was spoken by the Buddha. There's some good evidence to think that it wasn't. I'm not going to get into that now, but uh, there is some evidence for that. Uh, because it, uh, it has its sense. But of course, from the Buddha's point of view, it's true. Just because you aren't a god, just because you be, be, are reborn in a Deva Loka, doesn't mean you have any particular wisdom or understanding. This is an important point, because uh, one of the things that you will hear when you are around Buddhist circles for a long time, uh, you will hear that there are people who channel the gods. Yeah, there is a, there's all these teachers around, some of them that channel the gods. Oh, I, I'm in direct contact with Sakka or Brahma, yeah? And Brahma tells me so and so, so it must be true. No, it mustn't. Just because you are even... First of all, usually when people channel gods, it's usually a delusion anyway, it's not really happening. But even if you were to channel these gods, even if you were in direct communication with some kind of, uh, you know, being way up there in the kind of samsaric uh, uh, hierarchy, uh, it, it doesn't mean they have any wisdom. Uh, yeah? Just because uh, somebody kind of comes down and looks marvelous and bright doesn't mean they have any wisdom. Uh, and this is kind of the Buddhist point of view. Just because you are reborn in a high place in, in the uh, hierarchy of the cosmos doesn't mean that you have any wisdom. Uh, there is a very a sutta which actually talks about this, uh, in, 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 which is quite interesting. And the, uh, the Sakka, Sakka, which is the leader yeah, of the heavenly realm, of the 33, two heavenly realms, according to the Buddhist cosmology. Uh, Sakka, by the way, was a stream anchor. Yeah, it's quite cool to have a stream anchor as the boss, isn't it? Uh, I wish sometimes you would be really nice if you had a few more stream anchors in humanity to read us. Uh, we don't have enough of those stream anchors sometimes. Anyway, it's, I think it's asking too much. We're never going to have those. Uh, but uh, so Sakka yeah, comes down to the Buddha, because Sakka is a stream anchor, he's a disciple of the Buddha. Uh, and then he asks the Buddha for a teaching. And then he asks the Buddha a specific question about why is there so much strife in the world, so much violence, so much problems. Everybody wants to live in peace and harmony, still we can't do it. Why is that the case? It's a very good question. It's a very interesting answer the Buddha gives. But uh, uh, I can't really go into that now. Uh, but then the Buddha says to him, well, uh, Sakka, he says, or well, he actually doesn't call him Sakka, he calls him Lord of the Devas. Uh, yeah, uh, 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 okay, my mind is a little bit, uh, getting a little bit tired now. I make things not come to my mind so quickly anymore. But so, uh, Lord of the Devas, um, have you, do you uh, admit that you have asked these questions of other people, uh, of other ascetics before? And then Sanka says, yes, I went to all those other ascetics. Yeah, I went to, you know, the, the, the standard set of six ascetics in India, Purana, Purana Kasapa, uh, Makkali Gosala, and these other kind of the famous sages that existed in India at that time. Uh, and I asked them this question. Uh, the Buddha, well, what happened when you asked the question? Well, what happened was that I came down, yeah, and when these people saw me, they were so awe-inspired. They thought, wow, look at this, this light coming down. You know, when a god comes down, like right, this massive light coming down, they were so kind of awe-inspired that straight away they came down and asked to become my disciples. <laughs> yeah, I wanted to ask them to become their disciples, but they wanted to become my disciples straight away because they were so awe-inspired by this light and everything. Yeah. 
And this is what happens. Yeah? If you see something marvelous, if you see something astonishing like that, if you get the sight of some of these devas, chances are you think you have to have God, because it is just so utterly astonishing and marvelous. But actually you haven't. All you have seen is a light. Yeah? So we've got to be realistic about these things. That just because something is marvelous, just because something is supernatural, doesn't mean that they're well, not supernatural, but super normal, or whatever you want to call it doesn't mean that there isn't a wisdom there. And this is why the Buddha says, well, I have discovered a truth uh, which goes beyond that, uh, teacher of gods and humans. Uh, yeah, so this is what it is about. Uh, it's kind of, uh, this is what real wisdom is. And it's interesting that this wisdom, usually it seems, uh, is discovered in the human realm and not in the Deva Loka. So. Okay, very briefly, the last two qualities. Awakened, enlightened, uh, we have already discussed that. Uh, Blessed, the last word here, Bhagava. And uh, Bhagava is just an ancient Indian word which means like Lord. It really means Lord. And uh, uh, you you know, the Bhagavas, all the Indian gods, they are called, often called Bhagavas. And then occasionally, if you have some kind of spiritual guru, they will often call themselves Bhagava as well. If they think that they are really worthy of respect, they will call themselves Bhagava. Yeah? Bhagavad Sri Rajneesh, he called himself Bhagavad, he obviously thought that he was worthy of that title. Then. Often the people who think they are worthy of these titles are not worthy of those titles. Yeah, let's face the facts. So. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I apologize, I, I, I like to be a bit naughty as well, yeah? so I hope you don't, don't mind being a bit naughty. Yeah? Uh, anyway, that is uh, all for this morning. Yeah? And uh, I understand there's going to be some uh, interviews, chance to, to talk face to face if you like. Yeah? So uh, please uh, uh, do so, and we'll meet, maybe give us about 10 minutes maybe before you come. Uh, and it's, uh, I'm assuming you all know where the interview room is, it's behind the reception up there. Uh, so those of you who are on the list for today, please come over there. You don't have to come if you don't want to, you're more than welcome. If you have nothing to say, that's fine. And if you want to hang in there to listen, that's okay. It's really up to you. Whatever you want to do is fine with me. Uh. So that's all for now, and we'll see you back again at 3.30 this afternoon.